good evening, everyone, as we would make our way to our seats, get ready to start the service tonight. If you're thankful to be here tonight, won't we give the Lord a clap of hands? Just thank you for letting us be here tonight. A lot of things to pray about tonight, and we're going to get into prayer. If you have a, if you have a need, won't you just raise your hand? And let's just go to the Lord tonight with these needs. Lord, we're just thankful to be here tonight. Lord, thankful for what you're going to do in this place tonight. Lord, we're asking for your hand to be upon us tonight, oh God. Lord, I pray over every person that is sick that couldn't be here tonight. Lord, I pray that your hand of healing is upon their body and upon their life. Lord, I pray that you bless them. Lord, keep them safe. Lord, I pray that any sickness that is in their body, I pray that you are taking that away from them, oh Lord. And Lord, I just pray that there is liberty in this place tonight, Lord. I pray that your, your, your presence is here tonight, Lord, where we can meet you in this place face to face tonight, God. Lord, we need something from you tonight, Lord. We need your presence to be here today. Lord, we need you to lead and guide us in this service today, God. Lord, just be with us in this place.
Won't we just praise him a little bit tonight? He is wonderful. He is mighty. Counselor, Prince of Peace. He has so many things, but he's always good to us. He always blesses us and keeps us. Thankful that I have a God that never gives up on me, even when I'm going through battles, when I'm going through the worst time of my life. He's always there with me. He's always stretching out his hand to me to pick me up and set me back on my feet. Thankful for him. He loves us. He loved us so much that he died on the cross for us. He shed his blood for us. That's love. And I'm thankful that I have a God that loves me. I'm thankful for that. We get the ways to give on the board. We're going to giving right now. We have Givelify. We have PayPal at RiverbendPentecostals.com. You can send cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, PO Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. Text to give is 833-883-9311. Thankful for this prayer. I've seen it come to truth in my life. And uh, I know if we have faith enough and we say it with faith, it'll come true tonight. So let's say this prayer together. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaking together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, and I am blessed going out, and all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Come again.
making a way and there's nothing we can't do. Thank you for that. We will have the children that come up front. We're ready to pray over them. We always need to pray for them. This is our future generation. We just need to cover them with, with prayer every day. So if you would, would you stretch your hands forward and let's just pray over these little ones right now. Lord, we're just so thankful that you allow us to have them, Lord. Lord, I pray that you strengthen them every day. Lord, cover their minds and their hearts, Lord. Protect them everywhere that they go, Lord. I pray that they have peace and joy in their homes, Lord. I pray that you are showing them who you are, Lord. And Lord, just make a way for them, Lord. Y'all can, can go back. We'll have the youth come up. Pray for y'all. Pray for Brother Richard tonight, too. Let's just stretch our hands to these youth. Lord, we love you, Lord, and we're just so thankful, Lord grateful for your presence this in here tonight, Lord. I pray that you just protect them, Lord. Just cover them, Lord, with your presence, Lord. I pray that you anoint them, Lord. I pray that the direction that you want to take them, Lord, you are showing them the way, Lord. Lead and guide them in the direction, Lord. Let their home be a safe place where they dwell in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Y'all can go back. Turn it over to Pastor. I know he's got a good word for us tonight. Yeah. Thankful for him. Amen. Thankful for you. Thankful for Brother Terrence. Always ready to go. Good to see everybody here tonight. I, I, uh, um, I, I didn't kind of really know what to expect about a congregation because Everybody and their brothers got the stomach bug, the flu, COVID, uh, some mystery things. I guess it's really all mystery now. I don't know what in the world has been going on. Lacey could probably tell us more, but I had several pharmacists tell me that the whole year of 2020, they didn't fill out one prescription of Tamiflu. <laughs> and now it's back. <laughs> it's back. The flu hid. From, I guess COVID was so bad it scared the flu to just come out of here. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, we got one little addendum to make to your handout. I'll wait till everyone gets theirs before we, uh, before we get to going. We, if y'all help me remember when we get to the end tonight, we're going we're gonna to pray. We've got some more reports of folks struggling. And I uh, want to pray. Make sure you pray. Uh, I, I know that Christmas ain't all about presents. That's right. That's right. That's right. But it's a shame and a sin for little children to do without it. So if you get the opportunity, most of our youngins don't need nothing. So if you get the opportunity, be a blessing to somebody through the Christmas time. Be a blessing to somebody. And, uh, and I, I know this too, and, and sometimes I, I decided in some cases it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Anybody ever walked in that model before? Yeah. But uh, I know whether we eat, the way we do is we eat Thanksgiving at, at one mama's and Christmas at the other mama's and we flop it around every other year. But both of them houses, we got more leftovers and we know what to do with it. Don't nobody need to eat Christmas dinner by themselves either. Right. 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 Uh, you're invited. Matter of fact, they go to our church here. You just show up at their house. You can eat. I invited you to everybody's house. 
I do know we probably ain't got nobody got the nerve to tell you go away. So, uh, but uh, I, uh, I, I just, I don't know. I start thinking about we better be grateful for what we've got. We better be. We are blessed, blessed, blessed. At the bottom of your handout, um, uh, I forgot to write down where to add it, but on the very last thing, it says Galatians 5, 21 through 26. Is that right? 22 through 26. Uh, add Galatians 6 and 1 to that if you don't care. That's just the very next verse. And uh, last week I did not get finished. And by the help of the Lord, I will get finished tonight. I, I reined it back in a little bit. I did not pick up where I left off last week because I felt like God did everything he wanted to do. Because I tried to go back to it th two or three times and I felt like Hank Snow. So uh, if y'all knew my daddy in law you know what I mean by that. Just moving on. So, but we're still in formation. We're still in the being formed process. And I, uh, I'm super stoked about tonight. Uh, I hope you stay with me. Uh, and uh, if you don't stay with me, wave your hand or something and say, time out. I'm cool with that. <laughs> I'm not cool with you getting lost and just staying lost and going home and not know nothing that happened. All right, because we got to grow. I, I promise to goodness we've been talking in in here and in elements, and we're gonna we're gonna have a we're gonna have a portion of this formation that's about prayer, learning how to pray. And I'll be if Brother Raymond Woodward doesn't pop up on my YouTube today. It's called Four Lanes of Prayer or Four Channels of Prayer that he teaches, and it's about wasting your time coming to God in the wrong attitude, spirit, and desire for prayer. Yeah. you got to come. He's the king. Yes, that's right. And we can't come to him like we own the palace. Right. we got to come to him humbly, and we got to move around until we find what's, what's the Lord move today. You understand what I'm saying about that? What's he wanting to do today? So we're going to cover that a little bit later. But I'm telling you, there's a dimension to prayer. That I am persuaded very few people ever have known it. Because we pray from our will. Right. Most of the time. Right. And we also view prayer as a checking off the list. So then we can tell the Lord, hey brother, I prayed. Yeah. Just keep that in mind. Check me off today. Write my name down. And that's not prayer is a destination. We talked about that in Elements. Prayer is going somewhere in the presence of the Lord. So I just wanted to throw that out. But my point is, God is moving us in a unified direction. Yes. And there's an aspect to this living for God that most of us, if not all of us, have never experienced. Amen. I said what I said. I wasn't stunned. I wasn't stuttered, the first and most powerful indicator that we are in need of formation, which is time in the wilderness, the first and most powerful indicator that we need to be changed is found in our relationships. The first question that we have to ask is how is my relationship with God? How long has it been since you asked yourself that? How long has it been since you said, exactly how's my relationship with God going? I would dare say that most of us just go on living, and we very rarely, if ever, evaluate, where are we standing with God? Where's my relationship? How have I grown? How has it changed? How has it been affected? So the first thing we need to talk about when we evaluate our relationship with God, is how's he doing? You say, oh, that's nuts. Everybody knows the Lord is, thank, no, stay with me. First off, he's good. He's all right. Trust me, he's still good. Why? He's I am. 
He is not I used to be or I will be. He is I am. Malachi 3 and 6 says, I am the Lord and I change not. Hebrews 13 and 8 says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Revelation 1 and 8 says, I am Alpha and Omega. The you know that's A to Z in the Greek alphabet, right? So that means anything you can make up out of all of those letters, that's him. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was, <coughs> excuse me, and which is to come, the Almighty. We have to get we have to get this settled in our mind. God is not sick, God is not weak, God is not afflicted, God is not diminished. And I ask you, why would we think that? Because we have a tendency, the, the Christian people have a tendency to judge the health of God off of how healthy mankind is, how healthy humans are. That's just not true. Just because folks are rabid in their disdain for God and everything that is promoted in the movies, on TV, on social media, etc. Listen to me. Listen to me. Don't get worried because they're having a devil show at a school. Don't get worried. God ain't sick. Y'all with me? Y'all sit. Y'all picking up what I'm putting down now. I guess our faith gets under attack, and we perceive God as less than based upon what's happening in the world. Right? Okay. Everything that is promoted in mainstream is in the spirit of Antichrist. And it's contrary to the things that God has shown us. And that doesn't mean God is sick, weak, diminished, etc. Nor does it mean hell is winning. Are y'all with me right now? Does everybody, does anybody think that's an unfair statement that I just made? That we gauge the health of God based upon what's going on in the world. We do. I see what y'all share on Facebook. I hear what y'all talk about after church. God ain't sick. God ain't weak. So the first thing, do y'all understand, does anybody not understand what I'm saying? Because this is very important. We tend to view the health of God through the health of the nation, the spiritual climate, and that's nonsense. We can't do it. We cannot do it. He's all right. And that's why we preach on Sunday, open our eyes. Is there anybody besides me found yourself in despair spiritually because of what's going on out in the world? Your mind get all hung up and all caught up, and we forget what the back of the book says. He wins. Being on the Lord's side, we win. That's important truth that has to be said. We have to surrender to him as Lord. He has to be on the throne of our lives in every area. How do we know the Lord is on the throne of our life? What'd you say? We do what he says. Period. And we are pliable. Does that word mean anything to anybody? Pliable means we are moldable. We are shapeable. We are not stubborn. We are not hard-headed. We we're not stiff-necked, as the Bible talks about. But he can change me however he wants to change me. That's how you know. Three areas of checking our relation, our side of the relationship with God. How's my faith? And how's my trust in God? Here's some questions you need to ask yourself. Do I try to help him all the time? Now we talk about it in recovery all the time. 
But I am telling you, I'm still seeing it happen all the time. Step one, you're not God. I'm not God. We have got to say, if we're trying to be God, you know what that means? We don't think he can do what we need him to do. Now, I, I am going to let her fly tonight. All right? I, I, I know we're a little low and all that, but we're going to get to work because there's a whole lot of folks watching us on TV. Are they going to be watching us drifting? How is my faith and trust in God? How long since you asked yourself that? How long since you sat down and just thought, where am I at my faith? Where am I at my faith in God? Am I impatient with what God is doing or not doing? Do I really believe that he cares about all aspects of my life? Do I trust him enough to obey him? Or have I chosen to walk by sight and be led by my flesh? Do I even believe God really loves me, notices me, cares about me? Do I even really believe that God will use me? I don't have this in my notes, but it's a big one. Do I really believe God can use them? Yeah. Now think about that. How's my faith and trust in God? How strong am I in believing that God's got this? How strong am I in believing that I really can lay down at night and sleep peacefully because he's in control? Where am I? Is everybody all right with that? Yes. Yes. Where am I in forgiveness in my relationship with God? We're talking about our, we're, we're, we're gauging, evaluating our relationship with God. Because if my relationship with God is off, I need to be in the wilderness so I can learn some things about him, right? And about me, and about me and him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Where am I in forgiveness? So, well, how do you ask about that? Well, the first thing is, have I brought every sin, fault, and failure to God, or are there still some I'm weighing out whether I want to or not? Do I believe he will really forgive me for everything I've done? Will I allow God to forgive me? Will I allow God to heal my wounds? Am I even sorry for violating the word of God? We're talking about what we need to do in the wilderness. I struggled Sunday when I left here. And, and I, I really shouldn't let y'all see that. I, I'm working harder to not let y'all see that. But I know the reason why I struggled is because the word was working. Yep. And we generally do better and we amen and we clap and we holler when it ain't about us. When the word ain't messing with us. We get more excited when he's messing with everybody but us. Because my wife told me when I got home, I was... I was just talking. I really was. I 100% I, I know I was in the will of the Lord, but she said, I, re, I believe you was getting in where a lot of people are living. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I want to do. How am I in this forgiveness thing with the Lord? Are we striking a note with anybody? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> next is. Well, how's my connection to the Lord? How often do I pray? And how often do I pray effectively? How often am I in communication with him? How's my connection to him? How often or how long has it been since... I didn't come here 
to ask you for anything. I just came to talk with you, Lord. How long has it been like that? How long has it been since I decided to pray just to be with you rather than because I need something from you or because I feel like he's going to be mad at me if I don't? Do I fast? Do I read my Bible? Do I listen to God speak to me? Or has he even spoke to me? Do I consult God before making decisions? Notice I didn't say big decisions. I said decisions. And do I even really want God involved in every area of my life? How, that's how's my connection to him. Everybody okay? So how's my faith and trust in God? How is my connection to him as far as forgiveness goes? Have I got the sin? Because sin will separate me from God, right? Have I dealt with it all? And how's my connection to him? Those are three areas that I have to evaluate in my relationship with God. So next... Well, how am I in relationship with others? And I'm going to say this right off the top. We ain't doing so good. Most of us would rather be by ourselves. And that's a sign there's a problem. Say, well, what, what's that got to do with anything? How about when the Lord looks down from heaven and he sees the man he made and says, it is not good for man to be alone. Yeah. It's not good. So, first thing's love. How am I identifying with others as it pertains to love your neighbor as yourself? And let me just throw this out there. We're way too quick to judge and criticize. I said this several months ago in a lesson I taught, and it resonates in my head all the time. We judge ourselves by our intentions, and we judge everybody else by their actions. Wrong. We need to give the same mercy to everybody else that we want. So how's that working with me? I'm making plans to go to the wilderness. I'm making plans to be formed because I want to go to the promised land. Can I get an amen? amen. I want to go to the promised land. Am I compassionate toward others? Even if I think they deserve what's happening to them. Even if I didn't have anybody help me when I went through that. Do I feel the same compassion towards strangers? Do I exhibit the same compassion towards strangers as I do those that I'm close to? Here we go. Do I have to talk myself out of helping everybody I see? Or do I have to talk myself in to helping anybody? Am I compassionate toward others? All right. Do I care about others? Or do I go down the me checklist before I get to them? If the Lord tells me to help somebody, do I run it through the filter of self-preservation before I do it? Am I a victim? Do I talk about what's going wrong in my life and what's been bad in my life more than I talk about what God has done for me? When I care about them and when I care for them, is this going to hurt me? Is this going to affect me? going to affect my pocketbook? Is this going to cost me too much? Here we go. Will anybody know if I do it? Will they even appreciate my sacrifice? <coughs> Caring for one another. The question I want to ask you is, I really wanted to go to the promised land. 
But I think I'm seeing I need to be in the wilderness. Because if he lets me go to the promised land and I'm not ready, Here we go. We're, we're evaluating our relationship with others, right? Here's a big one. Forgiving one another. First thing, do I ask myself, do they forget, Do they deserve forgiveness? Do I plan to hold on to what they did for a while? I want to try to make them hurt a little bit first. I'm going to try to teach them a lesson. And everybody right then should automatically think, you know what? I'm not God. That ain't my job. Do I require things of others that God has never required of me? I almost feel like teaching this in Jeff Foxworthy style. If you require things of others that God has never required of you, you might need to go to the wilderness. <laughs> Am I a promoter of healing in one another versus do I have a tendency to make things worse, not better? Do I exhibit a holy objectivity or am I judgmental toward the difficulties of others? Do I minimize the struggles of others while maximizing my struggles and those close to me? Do I even care about the wounds of others? Here's what that means. If somebody comes to you and say, my cousin Leroy got shot with a bazooka yesterday. Oh, that ain't nothing. My first cousin, Suzanne, got run over by a tank, bombed by an airplane, and thrown into a pool full of sharks. I know I'm being facetious, but are y'all feeling me? If I'm like that, I need to go to the wilderness. Because you see, the trouble is nobody can trust me with their weaknesses. Nobody can trust me with their struggles. Because I'm going to belittle it, and I'm going to demean it. And I'm going to become part of the devil's work instead of the Lord's work. I need to go to the wilderness. Here we go. I'm going I'm to do a little bit of deeper stuff. How am I in my relationship with others when it comes to teaching others? Am I a good example? You know, the Bible says, I, ta I taught you this a few weeks ago. For when the time comes that you ought to be teachers, you've got to go back and do the beginning again. Y'all remember that? So what does that tell us? There will be a time, there will be an opportunity, and there will be a setting when every one of us needs to be downloading into somebody else what God has downloaded into us, or better yet, what somebody else downloaded into us, leading us, teaching us. This is an overlooked commandment. This is an overlooked aspect of relationship with each other due to the fact that that so many teach with a patronizing attitude versus a godly attitude. Because if you come trying to teach me like you're smarter than me, better than me, and I'm less than, guess what I'm going to do? It's a small world after all. We got to make sure that we got the right attitude as a teacher and as a student. Because I am telling you that the Lord will use the meekest, mildest, less known person to minister to you and teach to you 
that you would ever expect. You've got to be ready to learn from anybody and everybody. So here comes another big one. Engaging my relationship with others. How am I when it comes to correcting somebody? And let me just say this right now. If you're trying to do it on social media, you're already wrong. I have yet to meet the first person that has been changed because somebody attacked them on social media. So if you're doing that, stop. You don't need to advertise your holiness. You don't need to broadcast your holiness. And because when you do, you are telling them, you ain't as good as me. You're not as holy as me. You're not as pure as me. Can I give an amen if I told somebody? Is that all right, Brother Cody? Huh? Garrison, you paying attention? I might need some help tonight. The other day I talked about Brother Cody and other Brother Cody having my back, and Garrison told me after church, he said, if you ever talk about somebody having your back and you don't mention me, we're going to have problems. <laughs> so be ready. I may need you tonight. Correcting each other. That's our responsibility. But I'm going to use the woman at the well again. How many times have you went to somebody and said, you shacking up, you ought not be. Matter of fact, you've been married and divorced five times. And they fell in love with you because of it. Anybody? She went back and that was her rallying cry. Because you really, she doesn't say this verbatim, but you know what she was really saying? Come see a man that knows everything I did and loves me anyway. He's got time for me anyway. How are we at correcting each other? I've heard the last comment from a new worshiper saying they don't want to come to church because they feel judged about what they're doing. If they feel judged, it needs to be from the convicting power of the Holy Ghost, not from your lips or your fingers. This feeds off the teaching test. Have I made myself into somebody that you respect enough to correct you? And you allow me to speak corrective measures into your life because you know I love you. Or do I keep my mouth shut because my mind is off, because I'm afraid, or because I assume that you will respond to my correcting like I would respond if you corrected me? Y'all got that? Because, Brother Ronnie, many times we won't say something to somebody because we imagine they're going to respond like we would respond if the shoe, if the shoe was on the other foot. Right? So we don't say anything. You understand the problem ain't with them. It's with me. Because number one, if God, and I know I said this in the bait of Satan, but I'm going to say it again. If the Lord leads you to somebody that's messing up or lets you see them messing up on Facebook, he didn't do it for you to correct them first. What did he do it for? Pray for them. Intercede for him. Fast for him. Do you know you might do that and the Holy Ghost can get through to them and nobody ever has to know you knew about it? Right. 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 But how am I in edifying, building people up? Because let me show, tell you something. If you show up to church every service correcting somebody, everybody's going to shut you down and not listen to nothing. You better be selective and you better know the Holy Ghost has led you. Because if you're doing it to make them more like you, you're wrong. Right. Because okay. he's the standard. And this is very important. If I am lined up in all these things, am I doing it because I'm led by the Spirit or because I want to control others while exalting my own spirituality? Is my heart pure or am I acting out of God? What is my motive? What is my motive 
in obeying the Bible. Yeah. If I do it for any other reason than it's the love of God flowing through me, the first words that we say to somebody can, the first words we say in mentioning somebody's struggle better be to God. Not them. If you go talk to somebody and you haven't prayed for them, you're out of line. Furthermore, Brother Shannon told me about this. He reminded me of it. If you want to come to me for counseling or you want to come to me about a problem you got with somebody else and you ain't prayed about it, don't waste either one of our time. Spend, spend some time with the Lord before you try to spend some time with me. What kind of, what good does that do? I'm not God either. No. So, everybody okay? Yeah. I know this is different. I knew it was going to be different, but we're learning how to grow. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's going to get better, I guess, yeah. if that wasn't good. So why is this so important? To me, evaluate my relationship with God and my relationship with others. Why is it so important? You see, sin brought separation from God, which also fostered separation from each other. Because Adam and Eve went from naked and unashamed to naked and embarrassed. Embarrassment only happens in relationship. Okay? They went from naked and unashamed to naked and ashamed immediately after eating the forbidden fruit. The relationship with God was affected and the evidence of it was in the relationship with others. Same with Cain and Abel. Cain got jealous of Abel, attacked him and killed him out in the field. Why? Because things got off between him and God. Cain brought an offering that was unacceptable to God. Abel brought an offering that was acceptable to God. They have nothing to do with one another. Those two events have nothing to do with one another. But Cain made it about him and Abel. Why? He can't do nothing to God. That's right. So when we get guilty and we get angry, guess how we show up with God? Guess how it shows up? Relationship with others. Redemption, the price Jesus paid on Calvary, restores us to right relationship with God as well as healthy relationships with each other. Submitting to the commandment to have a right relationship with God and a right relationship with others is the commandment that makes everything else work. If your life is haywire, guess what you need to do? Evaluate your relationship with God, which will involve prayer, and evaluate your relationship with others. I'm telling you from experience that when you start doing this and you're mad at Sister Leanne, but you do it in the right spirit, the Holy Ghost is going to flip it around on you. And he's going to tell you, first off, Sister Leanne don't know you're mad at her. She ain't got the problem. You got the problem. I, I know some of us don't like this, but it don't matter. If you want to go to the promised land, we're going to have to get this stuff right. Because I'm going to hit on that in just a minute. Okay. Remember Matthew 5? 24 through 25, therefore, if you bring your gift, your sacrifice, your offering to the altar, and while you're standing there, you remember, everybody say remember, remember. that your brother has got a problem with you. Leave your gift at the altar and go out. First, patch up your relationship with your brother and then come offer your gift. Why? You can't get right with God tore up with everybody else. It's the key to a right life. It's the key to a holy life. 
every one of our griefs, every one of our shames, every one of our failures, our faults, our sins, generally have a name and a face attached to them. It'll always be our own when we start getting right with God. Because we realize, Brother Josh, I can't fix anybody in the world but me. So I'm wasting my time trying to fix everybody else. It's a waste of time, effort, and energy. And I am convinced God is not working with you when you do that. That's why you're tired. That's why you're wore out. That's why you're frustrated. Because you're doing it in your own flesh, on your own will. Hear this. We think this in the church, and we think wrong. There is no sacrifice, no offering, no gift that we can bring, or nothing we can do for God that makes our failure at relationship and exhibiting the love of God unnecessary. We cannot do enough good to cancel these two commandments. Everything, including obedience to the word of God, everything hinges on our ability to get this relationship right and these relationships right. That even means all in goofballs you work with. Can I get a witness? Somebody say something. This is why I'm in the wilderness. This is why I just can't go into the promised land and live in fulfillment. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. God cannot. Hear me as I tell you this. God cannot use you like you need to be used until you get this right. Can't. He can't. We've got, you want to be used of God and you want to be blessed and you want to be anointed, but you're mean and you're ugly and you're a smart mouth and you're judgmental and you're critical and you want to know what the problem is. Am I doing all right there, Derek? I hope so. I can't tell your facial expressions as much with the snow on it. Everybody with me? Yes. I want to grow, Brother Chris. I want to grow. I want to grow. I want to lay hands on the sick and they recover. I want to be surprised when they don't get healed. I want to gift of knowledge, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, tongues and interpretation, prophecy. I want them all operating in my life. I want to win souls. I, I want to baptize somebody Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday all in the same week. But until we get this stuff right with the Lord and right with each other, it ain't happening. We're getting some blessings on credit. This is why it's important that I grasp the magnitude of what the Lord is doing here in the wilderness and submit myself to the change that's waiting on me there. Okay, let's look at how this works. Loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving my neighbor as myself places me in the perfect place. That means I, that is the evidence that I am in submission to God and his will. Loving God. Some of y'all need to go to Walmart. No, <laughs> Sam's Club. Sam's Club. It's a three-pack called Zequa. And if you take a little shot of it every night, y'all won't be worn out at church. <laughs> and 
Is it not making a difference in me, honey? <laughs> True story. I wake up, I was waking up at two in the morning, three in the morning, being up all night long. Miserable. Your mind don't work right? I'm just telling you. I ain't got no stock in that company, but if y'all head towards Sam's, I'm going to get me some. <laughs> listen, listen, I, I'm going to try to hurry. I, I don't want to be boring. I don't really want to go slow, but we got to get this. I got to get in the right place, the right position. I got to be submitted to God and his will. He's got to be able to use me anytime. Y'all ought to go on YouTube and read the story about Chung Lee. Has anybody ever went and done that? You, 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 went, you went and listened to that? Remember I told you about Brother Marks? Is that right? When the Lord woke Brother Cody Marks up at 2 o'clock in the morning and told him to go to Duke campus, he had something to do. And there was a Chinese student there who'd been there five years. It was his last day there. The Holy Ghost sent him to a parking lot at 2 o'clock in the morning. Can God do that with you? Yep. To witness to that man? And that man said, this was the last opportunity. I've been praying for five years for somebody to come tell me about Jesus. And he was sitting on a bench in that parking lot. He said, you were almost too late. I'm wondering, where's the availability? Yes, yes, yes. Can God interrupt my schedule? Can God interrupt my life? Can God interrupt my likes and my dislikes? Can God trust me? to reach out and witness to my enemy? Or better yet, can God trust me to reach out to your enemy? Because if you catch me being friends with your enemy, you're going to be mad at both of us. How much? Because we don't have this relationship right and we don't have these relationships right, have we missed out on being used by God? we got to get it right. There's got to be some fear. I'm telling you how to get it right. How many of us have really thought, how's my relationship with God? How, how are me and the Lord doing? I'll tell you what we usually do is we look around to find somebody we know is in worse shape than us and we say, at least I ain't like them. At least I ain't bad as them. Because if they make it, I know I'm going to make it. I'm just being real. We're shallow. Loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving my neighbor as myself, places me in the perfect place, submitted to God and His will. This ensures... That I'm going to do it all God's way, whatever it is. The barometer of love is obedience. If you don't obey God, you don't love God. I say, how do you know that? How about John 14 and 15? It ain't in your notes, but he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Prove it by submitting to me. You see, when I'm under submission to God, that's going to blow your mind. When I'm under submission to God and His will, and I want to do something that's destructive, He can tell me no, and I'll listen. I don't think y'all got that. You mean I can be submitted to God and His will and still be stupid? Yep. Because this corruptible has not yet put on incorruption. This mortal has not yet put on more immortality. My flesh is still hungry. And yours is too. But I come to a fork in the road. The right way is the one he says. The wrong, that ain't never going to stop in your life. So when I want to do something destructive and the Holy Ghost says, no, don't do it. I say, yes, sir. I don't have to understand it. I don't have to reason it out. I don't have to, he don't have to tell me why. Right. 
since this is difficult under my own power, and I hope I can just stay teaching. There's a lady this week that asked me, do you teach Bible study on Wednesday nights? And I said, I try. <laughs> but it mainly turns into preaching. But I aim to teach. Look at this. When I want to do destructive things, he can tell me no, and I listen and obey. Listen, one of the things in maturity and living for God is you stop doing things according to how you feel and start doing things according to his will. Since this is difficult under my own power, can I get another amen? amen. It's always going to be difficult. Living on the two great commandments places me in a more powerful position because not only I don't have one source of power, I now have two. Y'all ready for this? You ain't ready, Josh. I told you, get that on your phone. And when I say y'all ready for this, you hit it. I'm going to give you one of the likes that goes all over the place too. Look at here. Since this is difficult under my own power, living on the two great commandments places me in a more powerful position because now I have two sources of power. The Spirit of God Almighty acting in me and an army of neighbors to stand with me. Because yeah. 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 I got it right here and I got it right here. And now I'm stronger. Isn't that beautiful? I'm stronger. That's why I stop staying by yourself all the time. Come to something. Do something. Get involved. Go over somebody's house. Even if they don't invite you, they got too good of manners to say hit the road, Jack. You understand? I've got the Holy Ghost working in me, but I've also got an army of neighbors standing with me. I have a new nature and a support system, both designed to keep me positioned to obey God and stay submitted to him. This is the pathway to living in freedom, dominion, and authority. Henry Cloud says it like this. This, y'all hear me right now. Is she paying attention, Brother Larry? I started to call her name. Yeah, listen. Henry Cloud says it like this. This gives me the power to stop ruining my life. To disobey God is basically to ruin my life. For disobedience to God is the pathway to destruction. That is the simplicity of the gospel. Listen, Romans chapter 6, verse 20 through 23 in the New Living Translation. When you were a slave to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. You got me there, Sister Scar? Romans 6 and 20. When you were slaves to sin, what does that tell us? Wait just a second. When you were slaves to sin. That's a fact. There ain't never been a time when you came into this holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result of that? You hear with me, Sister Scar? Look here. When I read something you agree with, I want to hear an amen. amen. You are now ashamed of the things you used to do, amen. things that end in eternal doom. Amen. This is right. This is right. Look here. But now, everybody say now. now. You are free 
from the power of sin and have become slaves to God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. Look here. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Hear me as I tell you this. The enemy has sold us a bill of goods that he doesn't believe. Which is, it's going to be hard to break free from that old life. We have got to stop living by that creed. Hell, death, and sin have no power over you when you're filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You do not have to be bad no more. I know that's bad English, but it's the truth. You got this on your handout, Romans 6, 20 through 23, the New Living Translation. Henry Cloud continues, If God says be kind to others and I disobey, I will ruin my relationships. If he says to be honest and responsible, and I'm a liar and a cheater, I will wreck everything I try to build up. We're going to conclude with this. Galatians chapter 6, 7 through 9. Let me tell you something. Learn to read Galatians chapter 6. It's a powerful chapter. Powerful. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. What's that mean? Let's get something straight here. God will never buy into our games. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And right at this minute, there ought to be some doors on some seed bins closing and say, I ain't doing that no more. I ain't doing that. I'm quitting it. Skip that. I, I, forget that. Uh-uh. Forget that. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Look here, verse 8. We're going to tie all this together. Stay with me. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Now, I may preach about this Sunday, but let me hear, hear me. Please hear me. Do not be deceived because somebody that claims to be religious does a whole lot of stuff that you want to do. And the Bible says you can't. This is the law. He that soweth to his flesh, I believe we ought to be able to have a little fun. God don't mean for you to be miserable. I think we can go shake our booty on the dance floor once in a while. I think we can tip back just two or three brewskies. That ain't no big deal. Come on, man. Everybody's got to lighten up, man. Don't buy into it. The Bible very clearly says, I don't know why I'm saying this, but it's the Holy Ghost. Wine Alcohol is a mocker, yes. and strong drink is raging, and whoever is deceived by it is unwise. We can't play games. I come from a long line of drunkaholics. I don't like it. I'm scared of it if you really want to know the truth. I told on my cousin Kevin Dodd for cussing one time, and if I'm not mistaken, got him a whooping because he said whiskey. It's a true story. Ain't that true, Mama? It's a true story. Because I did, I wouldn't repeat it, Brother Ronnie. You can't sow to the flesh without reaping corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. We don't have the option of taking a vacation from living for God. Because when you go here we go, Brother Blake and Lady Colton's this weekend. When I go to Colton's, I'm on a mission. 
not to get a steak and a baked potato or them southwest chipotle tips on rice with big old shrimps on top of them. <laughs> I'm on a mission from God. Because I'm not going there to get fat. I've done a pretty good job of that for the first 50 years. I am going because the Spirit's leading me there. How many of us do that? Drive the cake and say, here's what I say, baby, what do you want to go eat? And she says, why do you always ask me that? You know I don't care. Till I pulled in the parking lot of the one she didn't want. Okay? But really, how many of us believe the Bible so much that before we ask our wife where we're going to go, we ask the Lord, where do you want me tonight? Say, I think that's being too spiritual. I think that's obeying the Bible. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. That makes sense? Because if I go where I want, I'm sowing to the flesh. But if I go where he wants, I'm sowing to the spirit. And I'm telling him, since I gave in and went to where you wanted me to go, now I, you know you can use me. You can trust me. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing. Yes. God bless you. Why does the Bible tell us that? Why does the Bible tell us that? And let us not be weary in well-doing. I don't want you to raise your hand. But how many times have we thought after doing the right thing for a couple of months and we didn't see no benefit to it. Now, Lord, I've been good for 20 days in a row. Matter of fact, I don't think things got better. I think they got worse. You know why they got worse? You know why it was hard? Because you were breaking ground and you're sowing good seed. And it ain't easy. And let us not be weary in well-doing. Ain't, ain't it kind of funny that we don't get tired of having fun? We just get tired of doing the things that benefit us. Huh? Okay. And let us not be weary and well-doing for in due season, in the right time, in God's time, we will reap if we faint not. Let me read on here. Galatians 5, 19 through 21 in the New Living Translation. And I'm scared to look up when I read this. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Am I in the Bible? Is that the same up there? Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery. And somebody say, what's that got to do with all of us? Well, it just so happens that it comes from the Greek word pharmakia or pharmakia which is the word, Sister Lacey, we get pharmacy from, and it literally means a drug-related sorcery. Look it up. Look it up. If you don't believe me, look it up. Say drugs ain't in the Bible. I say they are. And where do they take you in your mind? Somewhere you got no business going. Hostility? What's that mean? Can't get along with nobody. Quarreling, same. Jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension. You know what that means? Breaking people up all the time. 
causing division, which is the next thing, division. Oh, he ain't done it. 21. Envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't you say to me, you ain't supposed to be judging. <laughs> I ain't doing nothing but reading the Bible. Right, that's right. But you know what? There ain't a cotton picking one of those things that I can't decide not to do. Verse number 22. King James Version. But, what does but mean? On the other hand, as an alternative, does anybody know what I just read to you in five and what's it called? Galatians 5, 19 through 21, the works of the flesh. What's unique about works is they can be done anywhere, with anyone, anytime. This, the fruit of the Spirit. See, we got the works of the flesh. I just read them off to you. Now I'm going to read the fruit of the Spirit. I wish somebody turned to your neighbor and say, he's telling us why this wilderness stuff matters. Look here. But, conversely, contrasting different than them other things I just read, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, that's patience, gentleness, that's exactly what it means, goodness, faith, meekness. You know what that is? That is, I can punch your lights out, but I choose not to because God would be upset. That's what it means. I can cuss you out. I can hit you, I can run you over, I can cut you off in traffic, I can T-bone your car, but I'm not going to. Meekness, power under control. I can do anything I want to, but I choose not to. Temperance, you know what that is? Self-control. Against such, there is no law. What does that mean to you? Not any situation... Not any circumstance, not any, where these don't work. There is no exception to the fruit of the Spirit. You can do it anytime, any place, to anybody. Now, check that. No, you can't. You, you understand what I mean. Every situation, the fruit of the Spirit's applicable. It works that way. But, let me tell you something about fruit. Fruit won't grow unless you're in the right place, the right environment, at the right time. And they that are Christ, y'all know what that apostrophe S means? Those that belong to him, here's the identified characteristic, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Says 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. What do you think that means? And I'm hurrying to a close. I've got like two minutes. What do you think that means? If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Here's what it means. If you're full of the Holy Ghost, act like it. Behave like it. Walk is referring to the way you live. Live is referring to the fact you live. Verse 26. This is important, and I'm going to go into one more verse and we're done. But let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, 
envying one another. Who do you think he's talking about right there, provoking one another or envying one another? Who do you think he's talking about? People you're supposed to be in a right relationship with. How do you know that? Because verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. Who is that? How about those that have crucified the flesh? Because I'm not carnal. If the flesh is reigning, I'm carnal. And I can't restore. But you know what I can do? Damn, condemn, criticize, and judge. Be mean and ugly when they don't do it like I want them to. And I dress it up and make it be holy. Oh, no, you didn't. If a man be overtaken in fault, ye which are with spiritual, restore. Look up the word. It's the same word when a doctor sets a broken limb. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, which says, I could damn you, I could judge you, I could call you out, but I'm not going to. Considering thyself. Because what happens to us when we see somebody overtaken in a fault? Usually our first reaction is, I would never do that. I would never. It doesn't say you have done it. It says, treat them like you would want to be treated if you did. Stand with me. This is the characteristic of the church. It's the difficult part. I would never be like that. Well, without the Lord, you'd do anything. Lord, I love you tonight. You're a good God, blessed God, a great God. I praise you. I thank you for what you're teaching us, growing us. There's a lot of stuff you want for us, you have for us, that we're not getting. But we're growing. We're going there. We got a glimpse of that mountain just like Caleb did. And we may be in the wilderness three days, 40 days, or 40 years. But either way, we're coming out, growing, mature, and ready to go up at once and possess the promised land. We're ready to take out the giants. We're ready to come against the walled cities. You've already showed us what you'll do. And you told us it was an example for us. I pray, God, you'll help us be strong in the power of your might. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I just want to tell you this real fast. We have a church Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Is Elements and River Bend Kids, River Bend Ignited in the nursery. 11 o'clock is worship. We will have service Christmas Eve, 11 o'clock only. We're going to put that in announcements. So when you text out announcements, I'm probably going to forget to text you back. So help me to remember. Christmas Eve, we are having church. Only at 11 o'clock. All right? No elements, no Sunday school. Be with your families. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. If you have it registered, please register and text party to your church yep. members. Yeah, Friday night's the ladies' banquet. is going to be here at the church this year. Uh, Sister Amanda's taking care of all of it. That's her present to you, ladies. And uh, uh, bring a $10 gift, but you need to sign up and let her know you're coming. And okay. If you're not coming and you've signed up, please let me know you're coming. Yeah, and if you, if you decide signed up and you decided to bail, let her know. Okay, and I was going to say something else about that, but I forgot. So anyway, God bless you. We love you. Y'all dismissed.